you know, you and I both believe that leadership is not a title. It's 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 how you it's what you do, and it's it's how you pull a team together for a common vision. Like if you see a general manager also cleaning up, or a general manager like saying, "Hey, like you know, Tammy or Tommy, come over here, help me clean up," and like you know, you know, you as a cus we as customers would never stand for this, right? And just remind them. I, I think they just lack compassion. Like. I think if they remember that, oh my gosh, as a customer, I would never stand for this. It just reminds them to have compassion for the customer as well. I think, you know, they lead double lives, right? Like one of them is their work life and one of them is their customer life. You know, you need to live, live in full 3D HD, like, like you, you, you would clean this up because that's how you would want to be treated as well. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Tension Podcast. I'm your host, Tim Sweetman. On the podcast today, I have Paul T. Tran. Who is Paul? Well, here's a list of just a few things he's done. He's co-founded and exited a full-service seafood restaurant. He's sold over a 1,000 franchises. He's enabled a company to go public. He's scaled restaurants in over 15 countries. He's helped a one-unit mom-and-pop business get acquired by a public company and allowed companies to become more profitable and enjoyable. So today, what does Paul do? He consults with emerging restaurant chains on growth. Uh, He's the largest franchisee of the Halal Guys with nine stores in Southern California, over $15 million in annual revenue. He invests in construction, data, business services, and other food startups. He writes a personal development entrepreneurship newsletter. He hosts YouTube, podcast channel, and best of all, he's on Twitter. He's a great follow. And this conversation was absolutely a ton of fun. So without further ado, my guest, Paul Tran. So let's let's go back and let's start at 10 years old, because I don't know your story of where you're at when you're 10 years old. But like I said, I think that there's like this huge opportunity to understand people if you start there. So what were you like at 10 years old? Describe that for people. Were you like the the big guy on the playground? Were you s- sitting off to the side? What kind of leadership? Uh, were you entrepreneurial back then? Like, tell us a little bit about that. Take us take us there. Yeah. Uh, so you're gonna have to guide and and maybe uh, dig at it a little bit more because I think as you get older, you kind of suppress it. Uh, and so feel free to get super Oprah like in the interrogation. But as in, in fifth grade was actually one of my favorite years in my my school career uh, I was in fifth grade and uh, that was when um I, I was I, I think it's a middle child syndrome I, I'm a middle child I have an older brother uh, who always followed my parents rules and got all the love and responsibility and then I had uh, my, a younger sister who was the only girl and the youngest so I think she always got the um got all the love and attention as well and so the middle child, I, I I feel like I'm hitting the stereotype where, you know, there's not a lot of love left for the middle guy. And because of that, you tend to uh, act out uh, as a way to get attention or a way to feel validated, probably. Uh, but maybe that's the story I'm telling myself. But at, at fifth grade, I was pretty loud. I, I got into trouble a lot. Um, I, I hung out with some kids who they were good carded kids, but I think because we grew in like a, a, a relatively poor area of uh, Orange County, uh, relatively, uh, we just always got into some bad things like fights and uh, I'd go to like the comic book stores and steal stuff and um, hopefully the statute of limitations doesn't follow me here. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I, 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 it was it was a lot of fun, but I got into a lot of trouble. I caused a lot of heartache for my parents. Back then, uh, back then you, you actually used to, be okay. it, it used to be okay to like spank your kids. Um, and my mom would spank me all the time every time I got in trouble. And it's funny because as I grew up, I always, when I got spanked, I'm like, well, I deserve that. Like I probably did. Um, but when I would show up to school sometimes with like bruises, <laughs> I, I would I would actually, uh, when, when other kids are like, oh my gosh, what happened to you? I was like, oh, my mom spanked me, it hit me, but I deserved it. And those kids would be outraged, right? And they, they'd tell their teachers and their principals and their principals would actually call my mom in and like she'd get into big trouble just because, uh, you know, child abuse is a thing. And 
<laughs> it's funny because after she told the principal, I won't do it again. Sorry. <laughs> she, she'd bring me home and beat me again. So again. <laughs> oh my um, but I was, I was just a bad kid as, as I bad kid, but not like so deep into like horrible things. It's just, I think you're typical, like re rebellious age, but never went too far to where it was irreversible. Um, but I think at my age now, um, I, I love my mom and dad so much. They, I, I realize as a parent now, like how much I put them through. <laughs> and how hard it is to raise my own kids uh, that I, I spend the rest of my time just being grateful and indebted to them. So um, that's how I think of my fifth grade. So, is, uh, yeah. Yeah. So the follow-up question to that is, what were the lessons that you feel like your parents tried to instill in you that you've kept to this day that you continue to apply in your life? And maybe you're even passing on to your two kids and maybe to the two dogs too. I don't know, but probably to the two kids. <laughs> uh, well, the dogs I treat like grandkids where you're spoiled and there's no discipline. Um, but the, but the, uh, I mean, one of the things my parents taught me was, you know, this is probably a topic of heated debate, but I, I, back then I, I feel like my, my parents taught me that for everything that you do wrong or not right. I mean, there's consequences to it. I feel like nowadays, consequences seem to be pretty detached from actions taken and I'm trying to reconnect that with my kids so that they know that you know you do the right thing uh, like the right inputs you get the right outputs uh, and um, and so that's one of the things my parents taught me second thing is just incredible amounts of selfless grace because as my uh, you know as a as a parent now I realize I, I'm always at struggle with doing things that I feel selfish to do, but I know that, like, for example, like I'm always tempted to let my kids play with their video games and I'm always tempted to like not pick up battle with them uh, because it's the easier way out. But now I'm learning that like, I, I'm not there to be their friend. I'm there to like guide them and develop them into people. And sometimes you do need to pick that battle. You do need to set them on the right path because no one else is going to, who's going to do it? Like society or devices or their friends? Like I, I can't, leave it to the mercy of them and so uh, i feel that's one of the other lessons my parents taught me as well but um those are the two ones that glare at me so switching gears how, you know that's obviously the the super early years how did you discover your and and maybe i'm putting a label on it that says it's a calling but it seems like you have a calling to be in the restaurant game into franchising in particular, which uh, I want to dump into your recent tweet about that. But how did you end up? It's always a weird path for people to get into being a restaurant. Sure. It's not a normal <laughs> path. There's so many different directions. So yeah. for people who don't okay. know, how did you fall into this new world of restaurant ownership and being a <laughs> restaurateur? You're right. It, it is a really wonky pathway and um, so to be honest the main driver was just being young and wanting money uh back in high school um a couple of friends were trying to make money and of course you could do it the bad illegal way or you could do it uh through um i'm pretty sure you got approached with like all the multi-level marketing uh programs um and so at the time in high school i had a friend who was like totally bought in and brainwashed into this you know you recruit two people and they recruit two people and everyone all of a sudden magically makes a ton of money and of course they would my friend actually gave me this book uh called rich dad poor dad and they're like you need to read this if you want to be rich <laughs> and like all these things and so i think thankfully i was able to separate the actual wisdom that came from rich dad poor dad and the scam part that was affiliated with it um, but I, I read that book and I was mind blown because it just helped me think about things so differently because I grew up in a um, household where uh, my dad was all about education. You, you know, you follow all the rules, you, you do well in, in, in school, you get to get college, uh, you spend the rest of your life, you know, working for 40, 50 years, and then you retire with debt. <laughs> and, 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 and if that was the right path to success and happiness, why is is are most people most people unhappy? And so that book got me into thinking in a different way to approach it. Like, you know, if everyone's ha 
un, if everyone's following the right path and is miserable, shouldn't we consider going a different path? And that's where I started thinking about being an owner, a business owner. That's what started me thinking about being an investor instead, where you're not tying, um, you know, your time for money. Uh, and so uh, that that pretty much just changed my my paradigm. It wasn't until I got into college uh, that I actually did something with it. Um, in college was uh, it was also my last semester of college. Uh, I saw this restaurant that was in my uh, neighborhood uh, called the uh, called the Boiling Crab. At the time, they were the only crawfish boil place in town, so they were the big fish in the small pond. They got the disproportionate amount of customers. Um, in my head, I was in my head. I was just thinking if I just opened a restaurant where uh, I was just serving the people unwilling to wait for two three hours at that restaurant, I'm pretty sure that I could have enough business to make some money. That was pretty much the supply demand gap. I didn't know the economic terms, but that was pretty much the gist. Uh, and so, and my ignorance in my past tweet, I mentioned that I got in because it was just pure overconfidence and ignorance uh, because I thought, you know, how hard could it be to open a restaurant? <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so me and a couple of buddies, we just raised a little bit of money. We took whatever we had of our student loan money. Uh, we took over an old restaurant uh, that had a lot of infrastructure already in place and we just opened and my friend who was not a trained chef but he knew he he had this amazing palate that would try food and he would know exactly what was in it so he took our competitors uh, recipe ate it and he he deconstructed it and of course we reconstructed it with our own flavor and uh i mean thank goodness uh, there's a ton of mistakes and it's hilarious uh some of the mistakes but we ended up opening and my hunch was right there was more people willing to to give us a try and we got a disproportionate amount of the value and uh, we ran the business for the next three years about we ran it, it did anywhere between 800 to 900 thousand a year like right off the bat so we got really lucky yeah i think it's a great transition because i think this recent um thread that you have super fascinating to me when i read it because it contrasts your experience in opening up your own restaurant and not having to pay the royalties and the advertising fund and all these things. And, and you also, uh, you know, had all this money sitting aside too, but then you contrast that and you talked about how you also had over a million dollars of mistakes, learning curves, inefficiencies. Talk more about that. Do you have some, you got to have, all of us have some war stories of the early days of, owning a restaurant or being involved in a restaurant, what go into detail. What were some of those million dollar mistakes that you made? Yeah. Um, I think a lot of it had to do with, um, you know, we made great money after the first year. By the second year, um, we got a lot of interest for franchising. Um, and uh, my partners and I, we just couldn't get into an agreement as to what to do with the growth. We either one of my partners, the the chef, the the chefy dude, uh, he wanted to just expand the menu. He wanted to just generate more sales per unit per, out of that unit by offering more menu items. Uh, another one of my partners just wanted to open more corporate stores. Uh, me myself, uh, because I was fascinated by the franchising side, I, I wanted to offer franchising, and um, I mean because of that. You know, it's just like four wheels in a car going in a different direction. It just we went nowhere, uh, and I so I feel like so many people were willing to start paying us franchise fees and royalties in order to be a part of our 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 concept. Uh, so that was one of the lost opportunities. Uh, another one was we just hired some really horrible people that stole a lot of money from us. I and mean, we had a couple people that stole, you know, workers that were just not vetted properly that ended up, um, you know, just taking money. Uh, and of course there's a lot of, uh, young Holly high school kids and college kids who hooked up all their friends. You know, that was pretty much how you were the cool kid. Uh, and so a lot of, uh, food costs got, you know, thrown out because of theft that way. Um, gosh, there's just, there's a lot of them, but, um, and all of it is just also not just having systems in place. We kind of did the recipe was the same. But how we operated and how we treated customers and how we got started and how we operated day to day was just like different depending on our mood. Uh, we just didn't understand SOPs quite yet. 
So, um, I mean, that's just a few that come to mind, but, um, yeah, I, I think this is good ammo for a thread in the future yeah. uh, for, for things, but, uh, that easily right there is like six figures in mistakes right wow. off the bat or lost opportunities. So before you move to kind of the franchising side and you diving into that world, if you could do it over again, if you got to buy the restaurant again and you had all the knowledge you have today, what you, what would you have done differently? Well, one thing is I would actually start reporting our river revenue to, and pay our taxes. <laughs> um, I, I think um, maybe it's a it's it's very stereotypical, but like with Asian businesses, uh, with mom and pop shops, you know, because taxes are so uh, overwhelming, uh, a lot of times these mom and pop shops don't report taxes uh, because they they're not trying to build like a massive business; they're just trying to provide for their family. And so taxes can be quite overwhelming. And so that's actually probably why a lot of like Asian brands don't don't scale and don't go global because it's it's hard. It, it's it's a hard mindset to get off of. So <laughs> I'd pay my taxes so that I have like a viable business to 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 share. A um, couple other things is I would um, I would definitely put systems in place. Uh, I, I believe that ignorance and overconfidence is a great way to get started. Uh, but it's not a great way to just continue on. Like after a certain inflection point, you do need to put systems in place or else you'll remain mom and pop and you'll be buried uh, in so many different ways. So systems in place. The third thing is just people. Um, I think we hired for the wrong reasons. We hired cute, cute guys and gals to serve people because we were thinking like if the food failed, at least, you know, there was eye candy. Um, it's so, so bad. But in, moving forward, I mean, the reason why my halal guy is, uh, does really well and do, runs well without too much of my involvement because because we decided to overpay for incredible leaders that run everything day to day. It's the difference between me being here with you or, or, or covering a shift that that someone needs me to cover. So um, the people. So that's what mm. comes to mind. I saw um, somebody comment under underneath of the thread about realizing that they were not a restaurateur but they were a chef and they were an operator. How do you feel like people can figure that out? I think there's a lot of folks that go in and they just go, man, I'd love a restaurant. I'd love to open up a restaurant. They go and buy one and they yeah. really quickly learn they're not built for this. They don't necessarily love their restaurant business. They just love business. So how do you help people decipher that? And I think that's a great transition too, to even talk about your jump into your career at Fransmart. Yeah. Um, under normal circumstances, uh, I think the best way is to to try on someone else's dime before you decide to do it yourself. I think if someone is a chef and they're very creative, they can either moonlight or work their job as a chef or as a creator, uh, and and, uh, and find out whether they if this is their true calling or not. Or you know they might find opportunities that they didn't consider before, uh, and so it's great to learn on someone else's dime. And I mean, unfortunately, it sucks for us as owners because that that is part of turnover. However, if it helps people find themselves and become leaders and who they be need to be, then I guess that's like the eternal compensation. I'll get repaid back that way. <laughs> but um, but yeah, there's so many opportunities to try without really risking it all. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of internships. Uh, you know, the food service industry is always in need of great workers. And who knows, you might end up realizing during that that you're not a creator and you love the business side, you love management and you thrive in these corporate settings where you just continue to level up and move up in the company. So either which way, I'd like to believe if you don't have any excuses and there's ways to try it without risking any of your money yet, um, you should totally do it. And you can also moonlight and do this as a side gig too. Like, you know, you can serve food and rather than do all this research or do focus groups, like make food, give it to your friends, like, take orders and and see if if people want it and whether you even like it so um yeah there's other ways to do it uh, other ways around spending six figures to find out later oh that wasn't the right thing yeah absolutely so talk about what you learned in your transition to france smart what is the the big takeaways from your time there yeah uh, so i joined france smart in 2007 uh sorry yeah, 2007, and uh, that was at the time when I was actually running the restaurant and working at Fransmart at the same time. So there, I have this 
horrible habit of double dipping. Um, I always like to do multiple things at the same time, which is why my Twitter profile is confusing. Like I'm franchisor and franchisee and a bunch of other crap. Uh, but uh, so at that time, um, I was trying to get my concept to franchise and France Smart, you know, they running through their filter realized that it wasn't like a franchisable concept yet. But at the time they were in high growth mode and, you know, I guess I, I struck a positive chord with them and they asked if I wanted to work with them and learn the ropes. And so I ended up ju jumping on and, you know, running the restaurant and also uh, the, uh, working at France Smart at the same time. So the next 10 years, um, I learned so many different things. I, I learned, um, I learned that most of franchise success in restaurants is actually not even making the food. Uh, I'd say making the food is probably like maybe 10 to 20% of the equation. Um, I think most people who make incredible pies, for example, and they get into the business of making pies, they realize they only spend 10, 20% of their time making pies. The rest of it's HR, the rest of it's marketing, the rest of it's uh, operations, the rest of it's t so many different things. And so I, I, I learned that it's it's not enough to just have good food. It's not enough to just have a cool concept. Um, and so um, I learned about building systems uh, and I learned about how to sell because that job requires selling, uh, you know, emerging concepts to, to, to franchisees. Uh, and I also just learned so much about everything around the business and not like barely about the business itself. So um, yeah, huge contrast. I thought it was about the food. I thought it was about the concept. So, you know, you and I've had this conversation about how to select the right franchise to get involved with. And yeah. more often than not, it it's the people behind the product that are more important than anything else. For and sure. And so, um, you know, too often it's one of those things where you uh, you get excited about whatever the product happens to be and you're passionate about that. Uh, but that that could come and go. You really need the people, and that that applies even within the business itself. You have to have incredible people. This stuff fails. I mean, if Chick Fil A does not have world class employees, we call them team members that are on our team. Yeah, it just doesn't work. And there is a tension there. Obviously, we can't serve bad food. We talk about you know this foundation of great food and clean and safe environment, great hospitality, fast and accurate service. Like these are really important elements of any great restaurant and food brand. Uh, we, we've got to have those. One thing that I think is interesting and I want to keep going here that's a part of your journey is having international brands, brands that work domestically, but also work internationally. How do you work through or how do you think through that transition or that ability to make it work in both places. I'm thinking a lot about brands, even like Chick-fil-A that have just announced that they're going to be going to Singapore and the UK and many other countries. Um, what do you think a brand, especially a franchise needs to have in order to be successful uh, internationally? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think I, I was, it's crazy. Franchising has taken me all around the world and it's it's an amazing experience and even though i've been doing this for quite some time there's still a lot of mystery behind it i mean i guess because each franchisee is so different each market is so different as well but at the same time there the same rules apply like you still need an incredible partner who's aligned you still need really good real estate people still want their food served in a fast friendly manner so a lot of a lot of the rules do apply but there will be a certain point where the brand also needs to swallow their ego and also be open to the local markets, you know, habits and customs and cultures. And for example, McDonald's, you know, it's it, it's become a thing where people go to different McDonald's around the world and they get to see their, you know, McDonald's chicken tiki masala in in India. And it, um, it, and there's also like, I can't remember. There's so many different variations. So they've figured out how to be a balance of both a well-known love global brand and, and just one that's also in touch with the community. Uh, another thing is um, a, a lot of the international deals that I've done have always been opportunistic and we weren't looking for them. 
Um, it's one of those things where you're just so busy focused on building the company and doing it the right way that you eventually start tr attracting these one-off deals. So, um, for example, there was one brand that I worked on called Elevation Burger. Uh, they're not huge here, but they um, they were based in D.C. Uh, I think there was one in Maryland for a little while, too. Um, but anyway, we were just busy uh, advising on like their domestic growth. And we had some investment banker who flew to D.C. for work. He tried Elevation Burger, absolutely loved it and couldn't stop thinking about it. He would just continue to harass us until we were like, OK, let's let's give it a try. And firstly, we're just like, you know, you don't have food experience. How are you going to do this? And they were willing to show that they were going to hire incredible operators. Uh, they had the advantage of, you know, financial man. They knew finances, uh, so they knew how to manage PLs. Uh, and um, we also flew out there to just look at the market. And at the time, you know, Five Guys Burgers, which is a brand that I've also been fortunate to be uh, to to learn from firsthand, um, was doing incredible out there too. Um, and so uh, we decided to give it a chance. We took, we asked our food distributor here if there were any affiliates out there, like U.S. Foods, Cisco. They usually have affiliates now out in Europe and Asia and Middle East. So we just got connected to their distribution system. Uh, in the beginning, we just did the hard work of like exporting the food directly from the U.S. to the Middle East. At the time, we did whatever was necessary in order to make the food taste as, as similarly as possible. And... Um, yeah, it, it worked out. I mean, whereas Elevation Burger had, you know, unit volumes of like 1 million, 1.5 here in the Middle East and like Bahrain, Kuwait, Dubai, they were doing like three to five million, like right off the bat. So um, it's like opportunistic stuff like this uh, that that we just explored. That 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 has to help the food cost um, <laughs> of, of, of importing everything. Yeah. It's well, the only way the, to deal with it. The labor cost there is a little bit different and it's a little bit better, a pretty economical there. Uh, so I think that helped offset. But it's funny, uh, P&L's, COGS, prime costs tend to be kind of similar. Uh, uh, but anyway, that's for another conversation for oh, another that's time. That's really, really interesting. Do you feel like there's a huge opportunity internationally that maybe franchise orders domestically aren't thinking about? Or is it really just you just need to be open and willing to take advantage of things as they come up? Yeah, great question. Um, my only experience, I'm super limited in the fact that we only entertain international uh, when people from overseas reach out to us, uh, which reach out to my brands. Um, that's when, because it's so much work and it's so much of an investment to build out distribution and support out there that number one, we need to make sure these partners are super well capitalized Number two, we're very committed because um, you know most of, we don't want to just be another number in their business portfolio. We need someone who's like kind of like live, breathe, eat the brand, uh, and we just need to like a large commitment of like anywhere from five to ten stores. We need the large franchise fees to pay for people to fly out there, support, set up distribution, training, uh, all these little things. Um, so is, if the if the if there's enough capital to to support it, then we'll entertain it. If not, then you know we can't do one two store deals. At least from my experience. Are you looking for new ways to navigate the many tensions in your life? Do you want to learn how to embrace these tensions to create innovative solutions you never thought possible? Then you're going to want to check out the Tension Newsletter, dedicated to exploring all of the many, many tensions we encounter in life. Each week, we delve into topics like work-life balance, profit versus people, profit versus purpose, the political and social tensions that all impact us. Our contributors, including myself, will offer insights and practical advice on how to embrace these tensions and create solutions and innovations that can transform your life. So if you're ready to take your life to the next level and learn how to harness the power of tension to drive innovation and growth, I ask you to sign up for our newsletter today. You want want to miss out on this incredible opportunity to explore the tensions that shape our lives and discover new ways to thrive as human beings directly to your inbox. All right, back to the show. That's right. Cool. All right. Well, let's talk about current day and what you're doing with the Halal guys. Talk about how in the world did you become the largest franchisee? Because this is a fascinating story. <laughs> um, I just asked, please. Um, just kidding. 
so so halal guy so I, I was still working at france smart uh i was on my seventh year uh you know, consulting and um halal guys became a client uh i was super excited because every time i went to new york i always went to the halal guys cart this is before even they became a client i was just always in love with that brand and so when they became a client um i was just consulting for them and helping them you know put systems in place and help them uh, build their first prototype for a, a brick and mortar location because before they franchised they were just food carts and and that's it and and so we needed to build a prototype for how franchising stores are going to be moving forward during that time um, you know I, I always had the itch to jump back into franchising uh, sorry into restaurants and during that time with France part I learned so much that I wanted to uh, deploy I wanted to actually use the the knowledge that I gained uh, I also wanted to practice what I preached as well. I felt like, you know, I can consult, but I can actually live it as well. Uh, and um, and so during that time, I, I also looked around my marketplace in Southern California. And there's a lot of pizza, there's a lot of burgers, uh, and a lot of like the usual suspects, but there wasn't anything Middle Eastern Mediterranean. I mean, Cava was kind of there at the time, and there's a small brand around here called Luna Grill. Otherwise, it was very scattered decentralized um bunch of mom and pops that weren't serving the mainstream just like you know before chipotle there's just but just a bunch of mexican food restaurants that were just hole in the wall mom and pops there was not one that was well branded and meant for mainstream america so i thought hello guys would be the one so uh during that time i asked my boss dan Rowe if i could double dip again uh and um I told them I wanted to, I feel like I would be a much better consultant if I actually practice what I preach. Uh, he, uh, he let me fly out to New York and convince the owners that, hey, you know, I can still consult and add value there, but I also want to be a franchisee and have boots on the ground. I think that would be a much more valuable proposition. They approved it. So I built a, uh, a team. Uh, I, I raised a fund prior to coming out uh, to show them that I was well capitalized. Uh, and I uh, just bought the rights for Southern California. So um, uh, I built the first three stores within 12 months. Uh, we hired an incredible person to run ops. Uh, she was our day one employee, and she's been with us ever since. She started off as our store manager. Uh, she was heavily under underrated because she already managed like 20 Jamba Juices and a bunch of other restaurants. So we knew that she was going to be the right person to scale up with. She's still with us to this day. It's funny because she she's grateful to us for the opportunity, but she's changed our lives. So uh, I love that. I love that exchange. But um, we helped. We pretty much opened uh, eleven stores within uh, four four years. Uh, and we before the pandemic, we did about twenty million in sales. Uh, during the pandemic, we lost two stores. And so we're down to about 15 to 16 million a year, uh, quite profitable at, at this point. Uh, if you want to get into the two stores that close us, that's, that's cool too, because there's lessons in there. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, by store three, I left France Mart to focus on the stores. Um, but I still get bugged all the time about from, from mom and pops that want to franchise. So uh, instead of taking money from distributions from the stores, I just left it in there and I just make my money uh, consulting uh, for, for brands. So that's my deal. Mm. Okay. So I have a few follow-up questions. One is just me being super curious because I'm on the franchisee space um, and I didn't have to raise capital for what I'm doing. And again, I probably need a whole podcast on selection and Chick-fil-A and all those good things. But this is an area where I know a lot of people are going to be interested and I'm super interested in this too. So you said before you went there, you raised the capital. So as much as you're willing to share, what did your process look like? What did you learn? And I don't know if this was the first time you raised capital for something of this size, but yeah, um, how, did, how did you go about that? How do you think about raising capital? I know it's a big thing that you're consulting people on too. So um, how do you, what were the lessons you learned and how do you go about raising capital for a venture like this. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, not financial advice. Please consult your people. Uh, you and I are not going to jail for this. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, as far as raising capital, um, you know, my, my knowledge is limited to just what I've seen done in the restaurant business. So there's many different ways. There's no one way. 
uh, for for what we did with the halal guys, we assumed that we assumed that we needed to we wanted to raise enough money for ten stores, uh, you know, to to build in the next two years. So what we did was we assumed that each store would cost five hundred thousand. So we built a fund, we raised uh, $5 million to pretty much take care of 10 stores. Uh, we also raised a separate fund in order to raise money to uh, you know, pay for the franchise fees as well, because to tie down Orange County and LA County was a pretty large nut. That was about, it is uh, in the higher six figures. So um, the way we approached it was, um, again, we raised 500000 per store and each store needed to be majority owned by us because franchises were approved thus. They, they don't want to be dealing with anyone else. So we needed to make sure we were majority ownership. So we sold uh, stores at 500000 for um, we would have 60% ownership of the store. And then the passive investors who funded our stores would get 40% ownership. And uh, at that level, if, if, and we would, you know, if, if franchise, if investors would get, 40% of the profits forever, you know, according to the equity, that would take them a very long time to make their money back. It wasn't a very sexy proposition. So what we needed to do is we gave them accelerated payback or preferred shares, uh, which was like, you know, artificial acceleration of profits. So we gave them 80% of the profits until they made their money back. We would only get 20%. Uh, and so some of our franchise, uh, sorry, some of our investors were able to make their money back pretty quickly, which I'm really happy about. Uh, and, um, we also charged a management fee as well, just like real estate where, you know, there's a property management company that manages, uh, you know, investors property. We charged an active management fee for running the stores, handling marketing, HR, finance, investor relations. So we charged a, uh, 5% management fee. So 5% of sales. So the, the artificial preferred share was an incentive to be as profitable as soon as possible. And then the manager fee was just a, an incentive to drive high sales. So I feel like both of those incentives were in line for, for us to be motivated and for our investors to be, you know, to, 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 to fund our stores. Uh, and so, um, we, we probably under raised because building stores in California, uh, were more than 500,000. We've actually had to take out loans before. Uh, we've also had to just Good thing all of our, my, me and my partners, we didn't take any distributions for years. Uh, so we we used our profits to pay for stores that costed way more uh, than we had anticipated. Like, for example, our downtown LA store was probably like 800,000. Um, so that's building stores in California for you. Um, you saw my tweet about like, uh, Halloween doesn't scare nothing scares me I, I own restaurants in California <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, yeah so it's, so it's, stuff like that it really is another animal altogether being out there I mean if you can make it work in California I think you can make it work anywhere that's yeah. for sure so um there's so many more follow-up questions on yeah. on that I think but I don't want to necessarily go too deep but I, I guess maybe a broader way to follow up would be, that's the way that you guys did it. That's the way that you set everything up. How do you consult now for people who are thinking about going and buying a franchise? You think I just think about all these guys on Twitter are going, yeah, you know, I want to. Sounds great. I've been reading all these tweets, and Paul's telling me that it's great to be in franchising, and I've got this opportunity. How should they think about approaching that, especially from uh, oh. raising capital side, because they may not have all the money. I think most people, that's what my learning was. It's like most people just don't have all this cash sitting around. They got to go ask somebody. Um, yeah. What does that look like? And it maybe super practically. So what do you tell them to do? How to structure the deal? And then two, where do you go get this money? Where is um, it? Yeah. So when you talk, you're talking about just consulting on the fundraising part, right? Yeah, just just on the fundraising um, part. I, I want to follow up on the people and and uh, operations side here in a second, but just on the fundraising side first. Yeah, I mean, in a perfect world, you definitely want to have all the capital needed and put a cushion of like fifty percent, uh, because you're writing a lot of checks before you make your first dollar back, and 
you'll definitely be bleeding a lot longer than you think is the normal assumption you should take. You should always over index on, on, uh, on the worst case scenario. Um, I'd like to believe that I had an unfair advantage in my favor, uh, because Holaga is, is a very famous brand. Uh, everyone who travels to New York knew about the brand. And so to name drop them kind of almost instantly had people like, I want to invest. And I think also because I've been in the business for so long, um, I've also been known as a trusted person to invest in as well. Uh, so your your reputation and your track record definitely matters. Um, and my partners, I chose strategically. I, I have four other partners as well. Uh, a few of my partners are more active in the business than I am, but they also came with their network of people that want to invest in things as well. So I will say that the fact that but the makeup of our team and the concept itself uh, made it quite easy to fundraise. Um, so I can't take all the credit for it. However, if there is a concept, if there is someone that wants to like get into a business, um, if you're just starting off and you want to get into a franchise, then yeah, be able to lean on the franchise's leadership and their track record and maybe their financials to show that a like there's a lot of insurance policies in place to to ensure that the success of this restaurant endeavor uh however if there are if if someone's trying to create their own concept from scratch um like i mentioned earlier like there's other ways to prove minimum viable product like if you are moonlighting or side hustling and you are making food and you're getting tons of orders and you have this crazy social media following and you're willing to engineer all these things around it, then that will be an opportunity for you to raise money a lot easier. So most people don't, they, they just don't do the hard work of building social proof, uh, showing them receipts of like orders that have been placed. Uh, you know, that will definitely, you know, get you a lot more attention for fundraising than not. Um, and a lot of times, you know, there's other ways around it too. Like you don't need like all the money that you, you that it takes to build a restaurant from scratch. I usually tell people that you know, there's a lot of restaurants that have gone out, out of business during the pandemic. Uh, they might be just horrible concepts or a horrible operation, but the real estate is great. And so some of my clients have been able to build out their restaurants for like one third of what they thought it would be uh, because they have all the hoods, ventilation, grills, uh, permitted for restaurants, the bathrooms, all that stuff's taken care of, and they can open for a lot less than they thought. So um, there's other creative ways around it too. And also um, there's another concept where uh, it was a burger concept. Uh, if you're, There's a concept locally here called Burger Parlor. They actually um, had a creative way. Uh, they, they, would, they reached out to an old breakfast place and they said, hey, you know, I know you're only open for breakfast until two, three o'clock. Do you mind if I split the rent with you and I would do a pop-up at night? And he gave them the spot and the the restaurant, the, the breakfast cafe owner got some revenue and this guy, Burger Parlor, got to show proof of concept and they did, they were so busy, they ended up validating the concept, getting the money needed to open their full-blown store. So there's other ways around it that you you just got to think differently than what the traditional route would be and don't limit your point of entry. So hope that helps. Yeah, I think so. And I mean, do you think, is it true that the concern mostly needs to be around the proof of concept and your focus should be on that more than worrying about the money? Because the money's there. It's going to be available, especially if you are doing something like Burger Parlor. I think that's absolutely genius. Or, I mean, Halal guys, right? They, they were in carts. Yeah. Yeah. Food, tr food trucks, those types of things really make a huge difference. And I'm sure that applies to a lot of other types of businesses. Yeah. Um, it's funny. It, there's a really cool quote. Uh, I can't remember who said it. I'll probably link you later. But money is important. Uh, with money, treat money like gas in your, your car. Does this sound familiar at all? Mm -hmm. uh, treat, treat money like gas in the car. Uh, I mean, it's... It's important to have, but but nobody's going on a tour of gas stations. Uh, uh, and, and what that means is that, yeah, money is important. It definitely makes things easier. But if you really, if you really, really want to get into business and you really care about what you're doing and you know this is going to work, all of a sudden, like, money becomes less of an issue and it's more about resourcefulness and it's more about 
how it's funny, like you become more resourceful and, and, and creative uh, under constraints. And one constraint usually is the money. Uh, and so um, I, I think there are more important ways to show proof of concept than just showing it with a bunch of money. To be honest, that's probably a recipe for failure because you just are going to just use the, you know, it, the money's just going to be blown. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, that's good. So you mentioned that one of the keys to success was finding and selecting incredible talent. So what's your philosophy on that? How do you go about finding and selecting and retaining really top talent? That seems to be a huge passion of yours. I usually say you need to go after assistant managers at Chick-fil-A or In-N-Out or some of the best in class brands. Like they already know how to do everything and they just may not have the opportunity to become general managers or they don't have opportunities for ownership. Uh, and so those are <laughs> excellent opportunities to do it. Um, but yeah, as you just go after, in, I feel like you guys have already done an incredible job vetting character, which matters more than skills um, and uh, just in kindness and, and, and a, a bias towards hospitality. Um, everything else can be trained. You know, I, I, I I'm, not too interested in a, a full resume or people with a lot of experience because that probably means that they have a lot of bad habits and there's probably a lot of things that you can't, it, it's going to clash with the culture you're trying to em, embody. So the resume is maybe just a baseline, but I need to meet the person and I need to see how they think and I need to see how they treat customers and I need to see how well they work with others. Most importantly, I also need to see how they communicate too, because good intentions and kind acts, uh, they go unnoticed or unappreciated if they just can't communicate it well. So um, just a few things that come to mind. So how do you make sure that you're selecting for success? Obviously you can see they've been working at Chick-fil-A. It's probably a pretty, pretty good slam dunk there, <laughs> but in general, it really is difficult. I feel like to find really good talent and then to be pretty sure that they're going to fit I, I, like what kind of questions are you asking or what types of things uh, have you seen as a consistent theme for great people especially who work in restaurants have the kind of the culture that are going to be successful um i think a lot of it just has to do with a lot of it is just scenario questions it's more like you know a customer comes in and complains about their food you know being this or that or, or they did they took forever for their food or what what would you do if a customer came into the store and it's funny because a lot of it can be trained but i just i'm listening for like caring like do they give a damn uh or or they just using because it's funny because so many restaurants like the way the workers treat you is just like and this is horrible, but then they would never ever stand for being treated like that themselves, but they'll do it. They'll do it as a worker. So um, a lot of questions is just more like behavioral based uh, questions. I'm not too interested in the skills part because again, the skills can be trained. Mm. Well, okay. We have to go there. Why, <laughs> why we got to go to why restaurants are like that. This is just my big culture question. This like drives me crazy is that, most brands, especially restaurants that you go into, especially in the quick service industry, you have horrible service. What, like, what is going on behind the scenes? Because we can't just blame the workers for this. This is just my theory. Like, we can't blame the workers for this entirely. But, like, just from a this is like thirty thousand foot view of franchises and and restaurants. Like, there's just like two tiers. <laughs> totally of, of restaurants and experiences. But I, I'm just saying like, I'm really tired of walking into unnamed brands that I have loved and there's trash everywhere and you're treated as if you're an inconvenience. Why is that seem to be accepted in our society, both from consumers and from restaurant owners and businesses? We could probably get into pretty deep on this one. Um, there's a couple of things I believe. I believe, like I mentioned earlier, actually, about what my mom taught me as a kid. I don't think there's a lot of consequences. I, and again, it actually goes, because there's no consequences for 
leaving trash on the floor or 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 things that you should just be doing. Secondly, um, people just don't care. Like you just you need to find people right off the bat that just give a damn about that kind of thing. Number three, I think the leaders need to just show them what good looks like as well. Like you know, you and I both believe that leadership is not a title. It's 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 how you it's what you do, and it's it's how you pull a team together for a common vision. Like if you see a general manager also cleaning up or a general manager like saying, Hey, like, you know, Tammy or Tommy, come over here, help me clean up. And like, you know, you know, you as a cus, we as customers would never stand for this. Right. And just remind them, I, I think they just lack compassion. Like I think if they remember that, Oh my gosh, as a customer, I would never stand for this. It just reminds them to have compassion for the customer as well. I think, you know, they lead double lives, right? Like one of them is their work life and one of them is their customer life. You know, you need to live live in full 3D HD. Like, like you 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 would clean this up because that's how you would want to be treated as well. Um, so a lot of it's just modeling behavior. So uh, most likely, if if a place is a mess and customers aren't treated well, I can guarantee that the manager is probably out of touch somewhere, hidden in the office, not really doing anything too meaningful. Is my best guess. Uh, because if the owner or the leadership was there and always in the front lines, treating customers, showing what good looks like, uh, it, it probably would be a very different culture. Mm. Yeah, my favorite Chick-fil-A operator had a chance to talk to him last week. And he was sharing about how, I'm sure there's a book or an article about this, but there's the producer mindset and then there's the consumer mindset. And so often we get consumed as producers about what's best for us as the yeah. producer. Yeah. This is the easiest thing. This is the most profitable thing. This is going to generate the most sales, those types of things. Instead of having this philosophy of being obsessed with the consumer, obsessed with the customer, what's best for the consumer. And it's like a mirage, I think, to believe that what's best for the producer is actually the best. Yeah. The reality is what's best for the consumer, what's best for the customer, more often than not, is probably what's best for the producer, for the franchisee, and for every employee that's there on the staff. It's going to lead to better profits. It doesn't feel like it at first sometimes, yeah. but I think it's there. Yeah. I think there's a reality that we're ignoring and and not accepting, and we are not customer obsessed anymore. Yeah. I think um, it's funny. I think someone just mentioned mentioned that oh the cons- customer is not always right and all of a sudden when people s- realize that they they think it's like a free agency to be complete assholes to customers or 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 no the customer is not always right like you know a lot of times these one lines just get taken so out of context right um and so yeah i i i don't i 100 percent agree with you on that i also think i yeah like you said producers it, it's just like companies that are publicly tr- publicly traded as well Sometimes companies are are operated to please the investors, not really please the customers, and so the align the incentives are misaligned. So I think another reason why, you know, culture or or experience has been suffering is because the interests, the incentives aren't aligned either. I wonder if there's a way to incentivize people for like clean stores and kind service and like that kind of stuff. I I think if people got bonuses and got rewarded or appreciated for that. A lot of times it's just the manager just saying, hey, I saw what you did there. That's amazing. And just to be seen and heard for doing good stuff, like instead of only being contacted when you're doing some bad stuff, uh, that helps and goes a long way too. Not not a, not a, not the, the clear answer, but that's something to think about too, I think. Yeah, there's a Charlie Munger quote that says, show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome. Yeah, 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 exactly. This, this absolutely <laughs> applies here. But yeah, I mean, I, I think... I think you're right. For some reason, maybe it was during COVID, we started, I, I started hearing a lot more of this philosophy in the restaurant world about the customer is not always right. Um, I mean, Danny Meyer has a great book on setting the table and he talks a lot about, you know, I put my team first, all wonderful philosophies. And I absolutely agree with everything that Danny puts out. I think it's awesome and it's it's helpful. But um, by the time this episode comes out, I'll have published an article called Spiritual Visions of Waffle Fries. 
and <laughs> it's uh, I love it already. <laughs> it's a story about how I got so consumed with producer mindset that I found myself sending an email that pretty much told a person they needed to go find a different Chick-fil-A to eat at. I mean, it was, it was, I was probably in a sense, right? If you, if you heard my side of the story, the demands of the customer was unreasonable. There, the, if I, if I told you all the details around it, you would go, yeah, that was completely unreasonable. And, and I described these folks as the living embodiment of frowns. <laughs> and and we all experienced that. I can't and, wait and, for this to drop, by the way. And so, and so, <laughs> and so um, I even had a conversation with one of our uh, assistant managers today about how the thing that keeps her at the restaurant and also the thing that sometimes makes her want to go away forever is people. And uh, this, is, this is a great example of that. So anyway, long story short, I send this email off. It goes out and I don't think anything of it until I'm sitting in the restaurant one day and I hear somebody turn to me and say, are you Tim Sweetman? And unfortunately, I was wearing my name tag, so I couldn't say <laughs> otherwise. Yeah, yeah. And I go, yes, I, I am. And she says, you told me and my husband that you never wanted us to eat at your restaurant again. I mean, just extreme. And and I was flustered, frustrated, very upset with this whole situation. And sure. I ended up, arguing with her for a little bit about the situation and pushing back and her husband came over and I felt outnumbered. And so I finally just basically just walked away. And this was all over the preparation of waffle fries. Okay. Like this was all a big discussion around that. So I walk back into our kitchen and in this article, I describe kind of getting overcome, taken up, into a bit of a spiritual vision <laughs> of a waffle potato fry. And, and anyway, long story short, I really realized that although I had a point, I was just solely and totally consumed with my own perspective as the restaurant owner. I wanted what was best for me. It was easiest for my team. And I wasn't even willing to listen to my customers. I mean, it was just so consumed by what was yeah. best for me and easiest for me. So I pulled myself out. I sat myself down across from this couple. And I describe it in the article as like riding along on a cobblestone street. I mean, that was the kind of bumpy ride we had to yeah. get to a conclusion. But listened, listened, listened. Finally got to a place where I realized, man, all these people want is hot, fresh food in the way that I'm preparing it for them particularly, like wasn't working. We found a resolution and I actually talked with them today. They were at the restaurant today. They come almost every single day and they absolutely love me, love the restaurant and, and are there all the time. And it's, <laughs> I, I just think it's so easy to get consumed with what's best for us, growing brands, the profitability, all those pieces to forget, like, why do we do this in the first place? Like, yeah. Why do you have the halal guys? Why are you in franchising? Why are you in the restaurant businesses? Like, why why do you love serving food? Yeah. Like, what's the what's the ultimate? What's the ultimate, ultimate, ultimate end game? Right. Like, it's. I don't blame you. I I run in. I get into fights quite a bit as well. <laughs> and so you're not alone. And I'm I'm so glad that actually ended up. Uh, I, I think it ended beautifully, but but. Uh, yeah, I can't wait for that to drop. All I yeah. can say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I still have the note from them right here of how terrible I keep it on my desk. Um, and it just says, we don't like raw food. <laughs> it's not, <laughs> And it's not. I mean, you know, it's just really funny that that's that's just the way it is. And, and so um, I, I also admire yeah. I also admire that you ended up. I, I think it just took time. <laughs> it took a spiritual encounter, but you eventually came around. And again, it's it's how you resolve it and reconcile at the end. So um, I love that. It, you know, like you you and I both agree. Like it, it, bad stuff is going to happen all the time. It's it's an opportunity to win a customer over. This is your chance. Yeah. So 
yeah. it looks like you yeah. want them. So yeah, it's huge. Okay, so I want to make sure that we spend just a little bit more time um, on the personal side of things. So you know, we kind of got your upbringing. We've got your experience in building brands and the lessons that you've learned there. Um, but that's only a part of you. You also uh, are a father um, and a husband. And so like, I'm always interested in listening and learning from really high powered guys and gals who are like just getting after it. They're doing like 10 things. They're on Twitter. They own a bunch of NFTs. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, I love seeing a different NFT every day. So how do you think about what's the way that you're intentional and um, lead as a husband and father? Yeah. Um, gosh, the way you describe it, I do do too much. Um, I, as a father, I, uh, I guess every single day, I'm always, you know, I'm, I'm a believer. And so I feel like a lot of my best moments in parenting come when I remember how much like, you know, my father loves me. And, and so I want to behave in a way that, that I want to behave in a way that shows that I, I am loved as a son. And so again, I think, you know, I talked to you earlier about compassion. I think compassion is where is the unlock when it comes to incredible experiences. And that also translates over to being a kid. Like, I feel like I'm a better father because I remember how difficult I was as a kid and how much my parents had to deal with that. And, and I, 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 when I remember that, I have just incredible compassion for when my kids act up or when my kids, it, it, a lot of times they're just hurt or they are, they they can't communicate well, or they're just acting out because they may not feel the attention that they need. And so I think compassion and, and remembering that I am loved uh, is, is where my best parenting comes from. Not always successful. Uh, I, again, I mentioned earlier, I, I struggle with selfishness and comfort. And of course I'm, I'm busy with a lot of things. And so I tend to be really short. Uh, it, it, that tends to happen quite a bit, but, um, I feel like when I remember compassion and when I remember I was a kid too, and I needed love, uh, that's, that's where I become, you know, the best uh, uh, father I can be. Um, did that answer your question? Yeah. What does that look like? Um, you know, cause they look like very differently for lots of people, but yeah. maybe specifically for you. I mean, is that just like saying something encouraging to your kids every day? Like how, how do you, how do you work that out on in the, um, in the, the world of Paul Tran? So you guys, poor souls get 10% of my dad jokes. My son gets 90% of it. I, I feel like it's funny when you become a dad, like the dad jokes become so much easier and it, it's partially a joke, but partially I find it with, it's a way to disarm my kid or when he's having a really bad day or when I can't connect with my kid, usually I'm like, Hey, I have a joke for you. <laughs> and, and, you know, <laughs> just like human nature, like when you can make people laugh, you disarm them and like the world opens. And I'm not always like a nagging, disciplining dad. Like I also can be fun. I also can disarm you because I'm trying to tell you something and I, and I care about you. So I feel uh, like breaking the day with jokes and memes tends to work really well for me. Uh, and um, a lot of times it's, so one of my kids is quite quiet and closed in and not very like communicative with me. I I need to have compassion and know that it's it's more like how he communicates and it's more like for him, it's the ministry of presence. I just need to be there, show that I care and you could tell the light in his eyes like when 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 I just need to be there cuz I think us as guys and as men like we just want to fix shit all the time like, we just want things to be done like so that that's one the other one is is a hardcore uh, introvert but he's also very communicative uh, about his needs and he's very picky uh, so a lot of times I just need to listen uh, and uh, and and just spend a lot, for both of them to be honest it's just being there I learned that I'm actually not as cool as I think I am. And I it's okay that I don't understand everything that they're going through or they're doing. I think I just need to spend time. In it. How do you, you spell love, T-I-M-E? Like you just need to be there for them. So um, I always try to make an effort to uh, 
um, be at all their baseball games. Pick, I actually take them to school and pick them up. I'm like committed to that. Uh, and so I try to spend as much time as I can. It's just in passing. I feel like when I'm driving them to school, like I feel like that's where they're the most disarmed and they can actually have a real conversation. Uh, and when I'm at their baseball games, like I feel like me committing my time there is is like I've earned the right to like ha- talk to them. It is how I'm seeing it. But um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. I mean, just the phrase ministry of presence, that's uh, a phrase I've heard. You're the second person who said that in the last week. I struggle Very powerful. with it though. I struggle with it though, man. Like I think as guys, like I just want to fix things all the time. But no, sometimes I just need to just shut up and just be there. Um, mm. So was it the, it's the Margaret and Mary thing where Margaret feels like she always has to do stuff and then Mary is just there, just there immersing and like, I need to be more Mary. So anyway. Yeah. yeah, and it's 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 probably a bit of like a uh, personality flaw to some extent where entrepreneurs are always get after it, move quickly, like you said, just fix it, whatever. You're yeah. always trying to do that, whether it's in marriage or it's uh, parenting or it's in the business. And yeah. so often, I, I just, I, I often wish that I was the quiet, introverted, slow moving, methodical individual in person, but I've just had to hire those people in my business because I'm just not that person. Um, you know, we do predictive index in our, our business. And so we just went through all of our predictive index results. And mine was basically rushing to move on to the next thing and get results <laughs> and, and, you know, just, just dominant. And, uh, thankfully I have a number of people on my team that are there to say, Hey, let's pause. Let's think about this. And I need to apply that as well in the way I parent and show up for my kids. And it's it's tough when you have these huge aspirations. I think it's just an interesting tension because you're like, I'm pro- I'm providing for my family and hopefully providing for their future by working incredibly hard. Yeah. But are they really going to remember those extra hours that I spent on the phone or consulting or at the restaurant? That's a really tough tension. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's, you know, a couple of things. Proof that we all need each other, right? That we all fill each other's gaps. And number two, yeah, I, to be honest, like my my wife is very clear about making me feel bad about the extra call or extra meeting I need to make. And, and I hate it, but I know when I come home, I never regret it. Like when I get to hang out with my kids and my wife. So yeah, uh, yeah we need it. We need that tension. Yeah. Um, if it, if it was just up to me and you, I, I think we'd be like multi multi billionaires. But we'd have we'd be so poor that all we, all we have is money, right? That's so. right. Yeah. Oh, that's that's so true. Okay. So I don't want to keep you all night, and uh, we are well past time. But I I feel like I could keep talking forever. We, could, we can do uh, a regular segment if you want. This is we, fun. We man. we might need to do that and just or at least a a, a Twitter spaces because it'd be fun yes. to just just talk talk life and, and management and everything too. Um, so what's on your mind these days, just in general, like what, what do you, everybody, every leader I know has got this thing or two that's percolating in their mind. They're just thinking about, they're running over, whether it's a new business venture, a leadership philosophy, a lesson that they've learned. What would you love to pass on to the people that, have made it all the way to this part of a conversation. <laughs> um, if you made it this far, then uh, thank you for your service and thank you for your sacrifice. And uh, t- thank goodness Tim is a, uh, is an incredible, you're, you're a really good host, by the way. I think you thank have you. really good, like I feel really comfortable with everything that I've shared and that's kind of hard to do. Um, but I guess nowadays I, I guess for me, I've been in the restaurant and the franchise world for so long that sometimes I mistake it to be my identity. Uh, and so lately I've just been thinking more about like, you know, what out like, I don't want to be this to be my only legacy and my only label. So I've just been tinkering with other things that I I would like to do. I I have to be honest, I actually truly don't know. I've just been so steeped in the restaurant franchise world and I feel so much purpose in this. Maybe I don't need to, 
a move because I mean, lives are being changed and I feel like I'm helping people. So maybe I don't need to change, but that's, what's been on my mind a lot lately. Um, also my kids are teenagers. Uh, and so within three years, we're going to be empty nesters. Uh, and so my wife and I are just figuring out what's, what's next. This is kind of like early retirement because by the time my kids are out, I'll be 45 and, uh, just kind of curious to know what else is is out there. So I, I don't know. Um, hopefully that gives a lot of people comfort that I don't know. We don't we don't always have to know the answers. And a lot of times this is what it's like to to lead by to take to step out in faith, right? Um, so, but uh, until then, I just got to be faithful with whatever uh, placement I do have. But yeah, um, yeah. yeah. that's so good. Uh, any call to action or anywhere that people can find you? Obviously, you can go to Twitter. Um, I guess we can point them to your website and, uh, there's so much good stuff. You're a great follow. I'm, I wish you had, you need 10,000 followers. We got to get you there as well. So, oh, I just uh, need, I just need one, right? Like we just need to change one life. That's I, right. I, I, I'm trying to not be so succumb to the algorithm, man. It's so hard. Like I want to look at, I'm like, how many hearts did I get today? How many impressions? <laughs> I'm just, but then, but, but, but every once in a while I get a message. So I've actually gotten like three consulting gigs just from Twitter. Wow. And uh, I'm being flown out to like Hawaii next month just because of some random tweet I made. So I'm trying to remember that I just need to serve like one person. That's all it takes. Right. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, sure. 10,000. I'll take it. <laughs> All that to say, uh, I'll still take it, but do, uh, do the work. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you're at Paul T Tran and then same yes. thing for the website. Yes. Perfect. Um, yeah. and so folks want to reach out in any way, questions, consulting, I'm sure investing as well. Um, this is not investing advice <laughs> on this podcast. Just to thought I may have to say that at the beginning, uh, which I love that. I want to make sure that I'm doing those kinds of conversations. But man, it's been a pleasure and we definitely need to do it again. Hey folks, thanks so much for listening to the Tension Podcast. It would be fantastic if you would take just a couple of moments to leave a review or rate us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. It really does help the show. Thanks so much for listening. To find out more about the Tension Podcast, visit www.tensionpod.com or you can find me on Twitter at Tim Sweetman.